Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. There we are, Michael Scaduto. Hello, sir. Dr. Tilly. It's good Dr. to see Scaduto. you. <laughs> for, those that don't, for those that don't know and have probably never heard of Mike on the podcast, uh, I work with Mike at Champion, so we're very familiar. It's not like I'm interviewing someone for the first time and I'm this casual, but <laughs> how are you, friend? I mean, it's been about five and a half years, right? We've been working together. So, I mean, I just want to say off the bat, it's it's super, super humbling. And, and I'm very grateful for you asking me on the show. I've, I've kind of looked up to you when I was a student at Champion and, you know, uh, that was six years ago. Um, but to see how much you've grown and see how much you've helped the gymnastics community and how much you teach the students here and teach me on a daily basis is pretty awesome. So wow. kudos to you. I wasn't ready for that. I'm tearing yeah, up. Yeah, I, I probably don't express that enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's an emotional. Should I, should I pull up my low key regular joke of like last, six months ago when you were a student? You know, it was yeah. good to get the notion. For those well, that don't know, I made a horrifically bad time joke one time of thinking that Mike had only been working at Champion for like a year. He's like, I've been here for like five years. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> it's a compliment. I just haven't aged in the last five years at all. So. Seriously. It's the like, beard. The beard yeah. throws everybody else. I look like a college student. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you for that. I appreciate the kind of words. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a ride, man. It's one of those things. I think I got this from Mike Reinald, our mentor and boss, which is like you get head down in it for so long. Like you kind of like, just like right, I got this to do, this to do. You get like a rhythm of like treating patients every day, then like the next speaking thing or whatever. And you like look up and you're like, holy hell, it's been like two, you know, two, three years of like doing all this together, which is dope. And uh, the podcast is at 200 episodes, like a million downloads right now, which is That's amazing. amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And so we just hit those stats and I was like, yo, what is happening with my life right now? I just forget about it. You just like talk to people for a living. Like, we talk to strangers for a living, so it's not that weird on a podcast, but right. yeah, sometimes you like pick your head up and you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's been a long time that we've been doing that. So well, I appreciate that, man. I mean, watching you from the outside, it's, it's pretty obvious how much you've grown and, and helped the community. So Thanks, I hope you, dude. I hope you recognize that. Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so yeah, kind of on the, on the piggyback of working together at champion, I think you have a specialty for sure in learning a lot about shoulders in general. And we don't want to make this only about gymnasts. I think people can get value from like just overhead athletes in general, but for sure we, you and I together see a ton of people for, you know, kind of like the loosey goosey overhead shoulder, right. Which is kind of the category I put this podcast in, which is probably like gymnasts, obviously, but like baseball players, you know, you could put volleyball in there. You could put a lot of like, you know, other overhead sports in there. And I feel like when I started to learn from Mike Reinold, I realized how much I didn't know about like the things I was treating. And then like two or three years go by and you get your own experience and you're like, oh, I kind of have a wrap around this. But every once in a while, I talk to other physical therapists or I talk to other people who really unfortunately are swimming up, I feel like upstream without a paddle because they haven't had the education that we've had from Mike and Lenny and those kind of people. So that's what I want to try to do is just like summarize some of the things that we've learned that are really helpful and maybe apply that to people who are struggling with labral issues or cuff issues and stuff like that. So how's that sound? That sounds great. Sick. So let's start with this. And uh, I think it's best to probably start with a little bit of anatomy, right? So people that are listening, if you don't care about the anatomy, and you don't really want to understand the dorky stuff, maybe skip forward five minutes. But for us, if you're a medical provider, particularly ATPT doctor, I feel like you have to really have a good understanding. And if you're someone who's a coach or a strength coach, who just wants to be a little bit more informed, this probably section is really important to kind of understand where label tears come from and stuff. So yeah, let's start with that. And I'm going to kind of mute myself because these trucks in the background. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think I'll start with the with the bony anatomy and we'll kind of work in layers, right? So the shoulder joint itself is the articulation of the humerus, which is your arm bone, um, and the scapula, which is your shoulder blade, right? So the, the scapula um, has a couple of different bony landmarks on it, um, but the glenoid is um, the socket of the shoulder joint and that projects laterally. So it projects away from the body and it's a relatively flat surface. Um, so in that glenoid, um, the ball kind of sits in the socket and the, I think a really important thing to understand about the shoulder is that the, the humeral head or the ball is much bigger than the socket, right? So that enables a few things. It enables a lot of mobility at the, at the shoulder joint, but that comes at the cost of, of stability, right? So we have this really big ball. Oh, we got a picture. That's beautiful. Uh, we got that really big. I didn't tell Mike that I was going to pull a picture up and I just <laughs> sprung on him. So now we have, a, for those listening, uh, sorry, but if those on video, you can see it on YouTube. Yes. So you can see the humeral head um, and it comes into and articulates with the glenoid. Um, so that's a very basic aspect of the, of the bony anatomy. Within the glenoid rim, so sitting around the glenoid rim, you have something called the glenoid labrum, which is a fibrocartilaginous um, structure. And the real function of the, of the labrum is to deepen the socket and improve um, the contact between the humeral head and the glenoid, right? Around, uh, wrapping around the humeral head and attaching to the glenoid, you also have the the labor, uh, sorry, the joint capsule, 
right? So that capsule, you can kind of think of it as um, a structure that wraps around and it provides a little extra static stability um, to the shoulder joint, right? So you can see the joint capsule there. Um, at certain points within the, within the capsule, there are thickenings, um, which we, we call ligaments. So those are the glenohumeral ligaments um, and they're, they work to limit range of motion or protect the shoulder um, at, in certain positions, right? Um, and then the muscular anatomy. So the rotator cuff um, is really the big driving force of the muscular anatomy. And the primary role is to keep the humeral head centered in the glenoid as we go to move our arm, right? So it's comprised of four muscles. Um, main action is to keep the humeral head centered in the socket as we move our arm, particularly moving up overhead. Uh, we need a certain balance of those rotator cuff muscles to be able to prevent excessive movement of the humeral head within the socket. That was well done. And I apologize that I didn't tell you I was going to bring those pictures up. I feel like I was throwing your mojo off. No, super helpful. Um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of tough to explain. And, and I think it'll be it'll be nice to be able to see the pictures. Yeah. And the reason that I think it's, it's worth going into that is because I think sometimes people, it's hard to wrap your head around how certain injuries occur and the mechanism of those if you don't have like a really in-depth, you know, background in anatomy. But I feel like some of the stuff we'll dive into in the, in the injury section, particularly like labral tears and like uh, instability or cuff stuff is probably really important to kind of reference those things back there. So yeah, if you, if you are a little overwhelmed by that, maybe pause the episode, go back five minutes and just re-listen to that one more time, because the rest might not make sense if you don't have a basic understanding of that kind of stuff. Um, so, okay. With that said, in the anatomy is, I feel like the next place to go is like with overhead positions or overhead sports, whether it's gymnastics, whether it's baseball, whether it's, you know, um, you know, uh, hitting for volleyball or stuff like that. I feel like sometimes people think that those populations are just all loose. They're all only thing they struggle with is dislocations and instability. And we actually see a lot of people who don't really have the best mobility. And I feel like that's really hard for particularly like surgeons and like ATs and PTs to think about a gymnast or a baseball player can possibly be like tight in any way. So can you maybe explain that phenomenon of, you can be loose, but also tight and like back and forth like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when it comes, when an athlete's in front of me, regardless of their sport, if they're an overhead athlete, I think one of the first things that I'm trying to determine is what is, what is their anatomy like? And I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out what's kind of their tissue quality like. So there's certain tests that we can do to look at whether someone is more hypermobile or more hypomobile. So whether someone's super loose or super stiff. Um, the majority of high level athletes that we see, particularly overhead athletes, have some aspect of hypermobility, right? We think that that makes them able to get into positions that maybe someone that's a little bit stiffer can't get into. Um, but again, that comes at a cost of stability, right? So I think what we'll see a lot of, particularly in, in throwers and gymnasts, right, is they have a loose glenohumeral joint, right? Or the, the joint capsule may be stretched out in certain um positions or certain aspects of the capsule, but they have this soft tissue restriction that may limit range of motion um, in certain directions. So a super common one that we see is a limitation in overhead range of motion, right? We go in and we do a passive range of motion assessment where we're stabilizing the scapula and they have about 130 degrees of overhead range of motion. Um, and, you know, they're having shoulder pain of some kind, right? And we start to hypothesize that, okay, maybe we have some soft tissue restriction, particularly the teres major, maybe limiting your overhead range of motion. And in order for you to get into a full overhead position in your sport, there's some kind of compensation that has to take place, right? So there's probably um, an aspect of a tissue that is being overused or you're using, a t it is accepting a lot of high forces and that is causing it to get tight over time. Um, and that may start to limit your overhead range of motion, for example. Um, but yeah, you see this adaptive stiffness in pretty much every sport, um, but it is super impactful on the overhead athlete because of the impact that it has on the glenohumeral joint um, going, at, at, especially when we start putting really high forces through the joint. Yeah, and I think it's, it's good to maybe just double click on that for a second and kind of retrace that, which is, the, the part of like the hypermobility in the joint capsule, which a lot of people maybe don't understand is that it's kind of like a natural selection thing. That's how I view it. Like, like the people who get into gymnastics, the people who can throw really hard eventually, like they need some degree of laxity to do their sport. It's what makes sports like, you know, challenging is that the highest of the high level people have that kind of genetic predisposition. Plus they have a work ethic and stuff that gets them there the same way that like, I'm not joining the NBA anytime soon being a whopping five, six, right? Like I was not gifted with the six foot four frame. You probably need to be athletic, but you know, I had super loose hips and joint capsules the same way a baseball player when they're younger, 
you know, the ones that are typically selected for gymnastics or baseball, they, they already have what they, you know, they need to kind of be successful. Whereas, as you're saying, is that over time, doing a repetitive sport can cause soft tissue to become adaptively stiff, right? And I think that's where the, the, the conjecture comes, which is loose jointed. Plus, I do a lot of throwing, which makes your shoulder like lat and terry stiff or like a lot of bar swinging on uh, gymnastics is what causes the same kind of stiffness in those athletes. And it's that kind of like separation of like, you can be loose, but tight at the same time is where, you know, we start to get into murky waters. Is that, am I summarizing that well? Yeah, definitely. And I, I think it, it certainly has implications on how we treat that person, right? Mm. If I go in and I'm assessing the joint capsule and I do find that they are loose and we have other kind of metrics to back up the fact that they're more hypermobile, but they have this soft tissue um, stiffness or adaptation, um, you know, I think a, traditionally maybe people would try to do a static stretch um, of that tissue where I think the people that are super loose jointed will tend to move through the joint a little bit more um, and maybe they're starting to compress the joint and actually make the, the joint a little more irritated versus doing some targeted soft tissue work we found to be super helpful um, in restoring normal range of motion but also reducing the amount of compressive force that we're putting through the joint with like a static stretch stretch at end range yeah and that's actually something good to talk about is we see that a lot as a trigger of people who come to see us eventually right they have this low grade shoulder irritation and you know we'll dive into more maybe it's like maybe the joint capsule is a little cranky or the labrum's cranky or the rotator cuff, whatever, but essentially their common knowledge, whether it's unfortunately their social media or web MDing themselves is like, Oh, I should stretch this. It's probably pretty sore. So you take someone who is already loose jointed and has relative instability because the joint capsule is moving more to make up for the shoulder Then gymnastics. They just do these like random stretches that maybe aren't really like specific to the soft tissue or in baseball, we see people with like bands, just really aggressively stretching with bands and stuff like that in the layback. What you're probably doing is, is you know, as Mike has taught us, is it follows the path of least resistance. You're probably going to move the joint capsule more to make up for that lack of motion. Right. And so that then feeds this fire of now you might be yanking on the joint a little more. And I see, so many people for both hip and shoulder issues uh, that come to us because they're just like doing a lot of end range stretching and the joint capsule is already irritable. Is, is, is that in what you see too as well or no? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a big part of the treatment for that person is, you know, addition by subtraction, we're taking away, um, you know, potentially an irritating stretch that they're doing. And, you know, I'll kind of frame it as like, Hey, let's try this. If, if you don't feel any different, you know, you can go back to kind of doing the stretch that you've been doing. Um, but if you notice that your joint, your shoulder, for example, is less irritable um, after a week of not stretching and, you know, we have our other exercises or goals that we can work towards and you're finding that it's easier to work into those goals, you know, let's keep let's keep rolling with it. So that is a big part of the treatment for sure. Yeah, and that's awesome. And that kind of leads to the next piece of, of kind of sharing about, you know, what's the common stuff that leads to headaches and problems with people is, and I think actually baseball and gymnastics is a really good comparison, because they both, although they're extremely different sports, they both have a very similar type of person who gets into it, which is like loose jointed, but also can develop some stiffness over time. But they have astronomical forces on their arm, and they have very, very high repetitions. And then they both struggle with, you know, year round training and not taking a break or doing cross training and stuff. So, you know, can you just chat quickly about in baseball, what are some of those really high forces that the shoulder experiences, then I can back it up with gymnastics forces and it will paint a picture of what, what injuries we're going to see down the road a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we'll talk about pitching uh, and oh, like throwing, um, but basically the amount of force on your shoulder during the throwing motion is, is some of the highest that you can, you can put through your shoulder, right? So in order to throw hard, you need to go into maximum external rotation, which we call layback, um, and then accelerate your arm to the point of ball release, which where your arm is kind of out in front of you, right? So there's some research to show that the rotational velocity of your arm is about 7,200 degrees per second. Um, so your arm is basically trying to spin around your body um, and there's really not a whole lot to kind of stop it from spinning around your body, right? There's some, uh, some muscles, some soft tissue like the uh, capsule um, potentially will kind of check that a little bit, um, but those forces are so high um, during the rotational aspect of throwing that, that puts a ton of stress on, on very specific structures in the shoulder. Mm. Um, and, and then at ball release, um, you know, your arm is trying to fly away from your body and it's trying to do that at about one to one and a half times your body weight. So, you know, mm. it's, it's somewhere between however, however much yeah. that may be for the person, but a, a big traction force kind of pulling your arm away from your body. Um, and when we talk about shoulder injuries, particularly slap um, and, you know, superior labral injuries, tend to see a combination of that force from the rotational component kind of tugging mm. on the on the labrum in a very specific spot and the force from the traction component 
pulling mm -hmm. your arm away from your body um, that can combine to create a slap lesion in the shoulder. Totally. Yeah. And so, and then on top of that is the repetitions are really, really high, right? To like learn right. how to throw well and to also be able to kind of get to higher level. Like I, this is where I'm extremely uh, un, unversed here, but I, I would guess that to understand how to have command over pitches and different pitches and then how to do what you probably need a lot of repetitions to, to kind of hone that in. And so you take an athlete who is maybe younger, not as developed. They have this kind of loose joint stiffness of soft tissue over time very high force uh, throwing motion and very high repetitions. And then of course gets into like year round conversation. It kind of makes sense of why so many shoulder injuries are happening in baseball, right? Is that, is that accurate? Uh, that's 100% accurate. I think the, the volume of throwing is, is way too high. Um, and mecha the mechanics of throwing, I think are super important in relation to the shoulder as well. I think um, a lot of, a lot of younger kids, they're, they're struggling to, um, they're kind of, they have difficulty with motor control basically. Yeah. So they, they struggle with repeating the same mechanics. Um, so you see a lot of variability in the younger kids and maybe that changes the stress on the shoulder mm. when they're throwing. Um, but also, you know, pit, like throwing instruction, I think is, has come a long way and we're starting to learn more about what optimizes the mechanics um, from a stress perspective, but also from a performance perspective. So mm. hopefully we're, we're heading in the right direction in terms of teaching kids better throwing mechanics to yep. help alleviate some stress on the shoulder while also, you know, improving velocity and, and things like that. Yeah. And it's funny. I hope that Mike Reinald and Lenny listen to this episode because like the parallels between gymnastics are so similar, right? Like the forces on a shoulder in gymnastics, the compressive forces on like either vault uh, going forward or backwards are probably like two, two and a half times body weight, depending on that's measured at the wrist. So you can imagine maybe, I don't know, one, one and a half makes it to the shoulder. Um, but the traction forces on bars are like massive, right? So we have like anywhere between two to four times body weight has been measured on the hand grips that they do when they swing. And that's just in basic skills. The actual like huge, crazy release moves you see in the Olympics or like all that kind of stuff, which are way more astronomical forces, nobody can measure them because it's like, who's going to put right. a sensor on and like, you know, get an in vitro shoulder in their needle, like needle in their shoulder to measure those things. But I'm, I'm imagining easily they're five plus times body weight interaction forces. So we have the exact same problem, which is we have really high compression forces and we have really high traction forces in a loose jointed athlete who does thousands of repetitions. Like these athletes are training like four hours per day at like 12 to 14 years old year round. There's like maybe two to four weeks off total in the whole year. And so it's like not shocking, you know, why some people are struggling. And so you take all these cultural factors of uh, loose jointedness, maybe stretching needs an update. You need, you know, a volume management program. It's a year round training, but also there's zero like, you know, education or, you know, implementation of just like really good strengthening programs that are like weight based. Right. And I think baseball is better at this, but they struggle too as well, which is like the best thing you can do to take a loose jointed athlete and protect them against high forces is probably take a little bit of time away from your sport and get super duper strong to make the dynamic stabilizers more help tolerate forces. But again, that's like a lot of fears around it's, it's not worth my time. It's going to make my pitching change. It's going to make my gymnastic skills change. And I think that's a very real hurdle that we're seeing change. But all those things, when you take a step back, you're like, yeah, that makes sense why there's so many shoulder problems. Like that kind of adds up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, in, in, in terms of getting buy-in from the, the patient or the athlete, um, in the clinic, I think that's really easy to do, right? We do mm -hmm. a test with a handheld dynamometer and we're actually getting force numbers for here's, here's where your shoulder looks like. And, you know, very often their painful shoulder is, is a little bit weaker, whether that's inhibition because of pain. Um, but you know, it's, it creates a pretty good buy-in on that standpoint. Like, Hey, we need to get your shoulder stronger. I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, on the broad, broad scale, educating people that this is something they need to do to prevent potentially prevent injury is a yeah. little bit more challenging. It's tough to get buy-in um, and get people to commit to spending the time to do that. Yeah. I view a lot of the things in the shoulder for baseball and others as a parallel to Tim Hewitt's research in the ACL, which is like, you know, Tim's research has shown that, you know, getting super strong and landing well is probably a good, good thing to, to do for young athletes, particularly females for ACL tear. And I find that there's a probably a often like a philosophical parallel to getting super strong and understanding good technique, whether it's how to throw or how to swing or how to do basics really well, is probably a really good thing for young gymnasts. We don't have the meta analysis to prove that, but like at a basic level, it's probably a good idea. You know, it's not right. right. And then, and then the, the judging and the scoring needs to adapt to that as well. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Right. That's like, yeah, I didn't think about that as well from the lower body, upper body. Um, okay, cool. So we kind of have a background. Let's kind of like dip into some specific uh, pathologies. And then on the end, we'll kind of run back uphill of how to help people and what to do. So with all that and being mind, so high forces, loose athletes, you know, issues, I think that 
in gymnastics, I wouldn't say I see a lot of people who have like these massive dislocations. Like every once in a while, somebody falls, they put an arm out, whatever. But I see more of like a, what I, Mike has taught us is like the micro instability, I guess, and how that causes some labral and or cuff pathology. Um, so with that foundation of anatomy and kind of background is, can you share maybe what the difference is between like a frank dislocation and what we see more often, which is like that micro instability category? Yeah. Um, a dislocation of the shoulder joint is when the, the humeral head actually slides out of the socket, right? And a true dislocation requires some kind of external force to, to pop it back into place. And so either an EMT or, uh, you know, someone in the emergency room physically has to take your shoulder and pop it back in, right? A dislocation is a very serious um, injury. There's a lot of things to consider when it comes to a, a frank dislocation. And there's long-term implications um, as to... Uh, the amount of damage that takes place in the shoulder, but also, you know, neurovascular concerns as well. So mm. that, that's definitely a very serious uh, injury. Even if it's only happened once, there's mm. going to be implications of that down the road. Um, and then there's something called a subluxation, which is where the humeral head slides out of the socket, but spontaneously slides back into the socket without someone else having to pop it back into your shoulder. Right. So you still have a big instability um, event but it wasn't out of the socket as long, didn't require that external force. Uh, so that's mm. what we call a subluxation. Um, so whenever the humeral head is sliding out of the socket, it has to go through some tissue to get fully out of the socket, right? So that's where we tend to see these, these labral tears. Um, for dislocation and subluxation, most commonly it comes out anteriorly, so an anterior dislocation or anterior inferior. Um, so that would be the gross kind of instability or mm -hmm. dislocation, subluxation. Um, this micro instability, right? When we have an athlete that has, uh, you know, hypermobility in the joint capsule or the joint capsule is a little bit loose and we expose them to end range positions. So whether it's end range elevation up overhead or end range external rotation, um, their, their static stabilizers are, you know, compromised, we'll say. Mm. Their static, stabil static stabilizers are not optimized because they've probably been stretched out over time and they have this looseness. So that's where it really comes down to your dynamic stabilization, which is your rotator cuff muscles. So um, people who are more loose jointed really have to have extraordinary, um, you know, extraordinary strong rotator cuff muscles mm. to improve that dynamic stability. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think conceptually people understand like the end ranges for sure so in baseball that's going to be layback right that's going to be like right. that very very end range for gymnastics that's going to be the bottom of a giant swing the bottom of rings and big releases right when you see someone catch a release move whether it's high bar or whatever they often are like literally like almost about to yank their entire arm out of their socket right. and so that's where a lot of those things come up together and for someone who's maybe not as familiar with the the concept of the micro instability the summary there is that the humeral head is moving around a lot and it's yanking on, like you said, the labrum and the cuff is probably like hanging on for dear life. Right. So that's probably why somebody symptomatically starts to get like a low level irritable shoulder that just doesn't quite feel good. It's not so much that someone is like straight up dislocating and it's popping back in, but like, it's just getting like a lot of tugging motion from all those skills. Is that, is that correct to say? Yeah. I think if there's excess motion going on in the joint, the, the rotator cuff is really working hard to try and stabilize the joint, mm. but we're exposing it to such high forces in certain positions where it's at a disadvantage, right? right. So we have to try to improve the function of the rotator cuff to, to help stabilize the shoulder in those positions. Mm, right. And so not that I want to like, you know, get people scared and stuff like that. Right. But I think sometimes in the in our communities, this like low level cranky shoulder is kind of like written off by either, you know, coaches or the athlete themselves or parents or whatever. And they keep training through a lot of that. So can you maybe explain the the longer tail of unfortunately what might happen if someone, you know, let's just go with like micro instability and kind of like the subluxation. So a lot of gymnasts be like, yeah, my shoulder slides around a lot. It hurts for a couple of days. And then I have a meet and I just like wipe it off and I just like keep training. But yeah. I feel like over time it starts to get a, a progressively bad scenario. So can you explain maybe the next steps down the road if somebody ignores shoulder issues? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I think it, it tends to not get better unless we have a targeted treatment approach to improve it. Mm. Right. So in terms of actual um, tissue damage within the shoulder, it is feasible for that to progressively get worse. So if we're talking about um, a tear in the labrum, right? If, we, if we're continuously exposing the shoulder to really high traction force at the mm. bottom of you know, a certain skill in gymnastics, um, you know, it, theoretically that if you have a small tear of the labrum, that could get worse over time. 
Um, and as the as a tear progressively gets worse, it's it's just further impacting your static stabilizer. So it's making mm. that shoulder that was already a little bit loose, potentially making it a little bit looser, right? Mm. And as we irritate this shoulder joint more, um, again, that that pain and irritation will inhibit your strength, right? So mm. we tend to see rotator cuff strength come down. So the longer that you're dealing with a cranky shoulder, um, one, you may the tear may be make getting a little bit worse if there is mm. a if there is a labral tear, but also that rotator cuff strength might be actually declining over time. Mm. Um, and that's kind of like a snowball or positive feedback loop that are gonna, it's going to keep those symptoms around for longer until we address that. And it has to be a multifactorial, um, you know, address of of all the issues that are going yeah. on. Yeah. And I think that like kind of like vicious cycle approach is what a lot of us see, which is, you know, you have a little bit of a loose shoulder. It gets a little cranky in your cuff. And like you said, your cuff gets inhibited a little bit because of the pain or you're a little bit more slidy in the joint and then you start to do more things. And the magnification or the amplification of that instability becomes more. So what used to feel just loose and a little like wiggly is now starting to feel like a little subluxy when you hit certain skills that are high force or your shoulder slides around. And like you said, you either cause a little more labral tearing or maybe a little bit more cuff damage. It starts to become like a mild rotator cuff tear or some like pretty serious uh, pain, but then that continues to feed, like you said, the looseness. And so now when you're, I see it a lot when athletes just like impacting in a handstand, their shoulders like, yo, I definitely felt my shoulder slide almost out. It didn't come all the way out, but like now my shoulder's killing me and I'm trying to do skills and it hurts even more. And yeah, like tearing like of a, of a biceps anchor or of a labral stuff. And that's what leads to people having to get like a, a shoulder surgery. Right. And so right. as you're explaining is, is there's unfortunately uh, a point of no return, I guess I would say, where you get so loose, you're like, you're starting to have unsta uh, unstable shoulders like day to day life. And that's where you have to have a surgery to repair the labrum, right? Or repair a capsule or something like that. Yeah. And, and I think there is still some debate in the medical community as to what to do with the micro instability patient, yeah. especially in the overhead athlete. Um, I think from a baseball perspective, a surgical uh, intervention, like a slap repair, um, or biceps tenodesis with a, with a labor repair or a bank car repair are really difficult surgeries to come back yeah. from because of the uh, loss of range of motion following the surgery, mm. right? So um, the problem is in, you know, in the gymnastics world, if we're dealing with micro instability, that's progressively getting into, you know, more of a frank kind of instability or subluxation. Um, the more often that happens, the more limited our surgical options become, right? Right. right? So again, there's a, there's a debate from the surgeons that are, what do we do with these people that are, are having these issues? Um, do we go to surgery sooner rather than later, or do mm. we try and, you know, uh, wait it out for as long as possible, as long as they're able to function? Um, yeah. And I, I don't know why my brain keeps thinking about like grad school, like the Amory versus Tubbs. Remember that? On acronym? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not going to go back there, but I think that, um, yeah, I think in my opinion, talking to like, you know, Dr. Mop and people around here is like, they'd like to have these athletes, you know, try their best to come to us for like three to six months and really get through a conservative protocol. Unless they, I think the research is pretty clear for like a frank first time dislocation, like you slide into second and something happens, somebody runs by you playing football, you probably need to repair, you know, the joint capsule and stuff like that. But the vast majority of people, they'd probably rather see them come to us and try to figure out what's going on and, and try to break that down. And so, yeah, I don't want to go into the surgery world for the podcast because people are probably uh, not excited to hear that, but also it's not the yeah. vast majority. So let's kind of go on the conservative route, which is now that we know about a lot of these factors that create it, what are some of the first steps? We talked about like addition by subtraction with like mobility work and soft tissue work, but what else when somebody comes to us with like this, like kind of low level cranky pain, um, what's the first kind of things you're thinking about? Yeah. Uh, number one, trying to get a really good history on this person and trying mm -hmm. to figure out you know, what, what in particular kind of brings on their symptoms from a sport perspective. Um, and then what, what's their, what's their background in terms of training outside of their sport? So, mm -hmm. you know, strength and conditioning work or kind of any kind of arm care work that they're doing. Right. And that'll, that'll guide how I treat that person and mm -hmm. kind of my intervention, um, with them as well. Um, but I think, from there in my clinical exam, I'm trying to figure out how irrit irritable is this shoulder, right? Mm. What can they tolerate from a movement perspective and from a, an exercise perspective? Um, where, where can I target my intervention to make the biggest, um, biggest impact? But the biggest things that we see are there tends to, with this low level cranky shoulder, right? We're trying to figure out um, what is the, what's the pathology if there is one. But then what are the things that are suboptimal in this mm. person? 
So the biggest things that we tend to see is, again, is that adaptive soft tissue tightness, potentially limiting overhead range of motion. If I see that in someone in my assessment, that's always going to be the first thing that I want to address, right? You have to restore soft tissue flexibility through some hands-on work, through some self-mobilization um, to restore normal range of motion of the shoulder, mm. right? Then from there, we're, we're going to do a thorough assessment of their rotator cuff strength. Um, and we're going to test it with a handheld dynamometer. We're going to get some, some numbers. There's certain ratios that we look for in terms of strength relative to their body weight. And if they're suboptimal in that regard, if their shoulder is not superbly strong, um, that's going to be a huge thing that we work on through the course of rehab is getting their shoulder as strong as possible um, to be able to tolerate those forces. Mm, yeah. And that's, a, I think that overview is very helpful for people of, you know, maybe those buckets, right. What of what Mike has tossed us to, which is like flexibility and or soft tissue mobility. Right. And then kind of that like baseline level of strength with dynamometer, and then maybe some sort of coordination or balance work. I feel like that for the majority of people, that's like, I, I find that they're not doing those three things flawlessly well, right. They're doing a right. little bit of soft tissue stuff. They're kind of doing some dumbbell exercises with bands or stuff like that. And they're kind of doing some other like weight bearing stuff to kind of get their shoulders stable. But I find oftentimes that like, taking away maybe 80% of the exercises and just giving them like five things to do every day or every other day to like a really, really high degree is probably more important than like, you know, the YouTube video playlist of 37 things to try to do. And I feel like, right. I feel bad for athletes because I feel like they get lost in the, in the in Instagram, YouTube rabbit hole of shoulder exercises. There's, there's so many exercises out there. Um, I think there's, there's certain exercises that target the muscles that we're specifically trying to do. And I think the key from there is applying the progressive overload principle and, and mm -hmm. working into, um, you know, a real hypertrophy and strength gaining protocol mm -hmm. for the shoulder, right? Not this similar from trying to get stronger in any other lift. If we're trying to squat heavier weight, we have to progressively add more, more load to the bar. It's the same thing with the rotator cuff muscle. They're just smaller muscles. So we use smaller weights, mm -hmm. uh, but we do need to drive that adaptation over time by increasing the amount of of load. I think mm, that's a yeah. big uh, an area where people kind of um, go wrong a little bit is, is they get to five pounds for their shoulder weights and they, they call it quits there, but really we can kind of push that a little bit further and keep driving those strength changes. Totally. And I think I want to come back to that because that's a big like take home message for people. Can you quickly go back to the some of the strength ratios? I know that in gymnastics, we don't have the same like flawless research from like uh, the big leagues and like other college guys about what is like the best cuff ratio. But can you just share a couple like back of the envelope tests for either uh, ER to IR strength ratios or stuff like that? Sure. So, yeah, in, in terms of baseball, external rotation strength is a key metric that we look at. Um, for a few reasons, obviously, the, the external rotators help to stabilize the humeral head in the socket also helps to decelerate your arm uh, when you're throwing. Mm. So we look at external rotation strength to be somewhere between 15 to 20% of your body weight mm. um, in terms of a ratio. We also look at internal rotation strength. We compare the ratio of internal rotation to external rotation, and we're looking for about a 60% ratio mm. um, between those two numbers. Yep. And the other test that we look for, we look at in terms of strength, we're looking for a relative symmetry side to side. Mm -hmm. Those are the big ones that we're doing. Yep, absolutely. And so then, then we can go now into the kind of the, why certain exercises are relevant for those specific like muscle groups or stuff like that. And so these come from a lot of the exercises we use come from EMG studies that Mike has done and other people that are kind of like, not the, like the only ones, but they're probably the most effective use of your time. Right. And so can you talk about maybe what are a handful of exercises that you find yourself giving out a lot that are probably targeting those specific muscles you just mentioned that are maybe weak? Yeah. Um, I think, the one of the biggest ones that I'm giving out is sidelining external rotation, right? Very high EMG of the infraspinatus. Infraspinatus is an external rotator of the shoulder. Um, again, has a lot of implications for a baseball player, but also for shoulder health in general. Mm -hmm. um, so sidelining external rotation, scaption with a dumbbell targets the supraspinatus. Um, you know, prone T's, prone Y's. These very basic and, and foundational yeah. exercises are super important they may be very boring for the patient, mm. right? Yep. They're not, they're not fancy. They're not Instagram worthy. Right. Um, but I kind of frame it as this is your foundational strength exercises. If you can mm. really nail these exercises, I think we can layer other exercises on top and you're going to do much better at these higher level, uh, more advanced exercises. If you've nailed the basics and built the foundation. Yeah. Right. And that always comes back to like some, like the more of like philosophical argument of why do you like really high level athletes make it to the high levels? Because they're probably willing to do the boring shit that nobody else wants to do all the time. Just as grunt work. Like I think about people, right. I'm not going to name names, but people come to our facility that are like pro pro level baseball players or like really high level gymnasts. It's like, 
ninety percent of their time is like just boring old basics, just just right. doing the same old thing. But you see the look in their eyes, and they're like trying to dominate <laughs> that shoulder external rotation exercise, <laughs> or they're trying to dominate whatever they're doing. They're trying to dominate it. So I think, I think that's a really important lesson, especially for younger, mm. uh, you know, gymnasts, baseball players, younger athletes in general. These things have they have performance implications. A healthy shoulder is going to perform better, mm. um, and they also have injury prevention. Um, you know, implication. So if we can, if we can prevent an injury, I think that's where we want to, we want to be. Um, so let's really put some, some focus and intensity into these exercises, just like you would practicing any other skill in your sport. Totally. Yeah. And I think, I think it does help to kind of get these like bigger pictures together. So, you know, someone comes to you and we, we rule them in as like soft tissue issues we got to deal with. Baseline strength is low. We're going to give them those. And then maybe some other dynamic stability stuff we, we chat about, but I think most people come to you and they say like, okay, like when can I throw? Like when can I get back to my sport? When do I get back? Like what is a realistic timeline for someone who's not a surgical case, but someone who comes in with like a, you know, low level labral and or cuff strain? Is this like a two week thing? Is this a two month thing, a two year thing? Yeah, that's a loaded question, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me um, the answer. Every yeah. parent's going to email you right after this. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, I would say in that first session with the patient, I am trying to figure out when in their mind they really want to be ready to go. Yeah. And they may tell me as soon as possible. Um, and I'll try and narrow it down even further. And we come, we will often kind of figure out a date that is something important that they want to be back for. Right. And I'll try to reverse engineer and say, you know, this is how long certain things take. We can't rush the biology of healing of tissue in your shoulder, right? That takes a certain amount of time takes a certain amount of time for us to drive adaptations of strength. Um, and you kind of start painting this picture of, of how long the timeline will take. Yep. Um, generally, it's longer than the person wants <laughs> yeah. for it to take. Right. So when it comes back to a return to play discussion, there's so many different factors that we're looking at. Um, you know, we we tend to put very high stock in uh, strength testing. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes in and their, their strength initially is not optimal, we'll set specific goals for them to try and get to. And if, you know, all other things are progressing nicely, if their strength numbers have improved, that's a good way for us to kind of judge whether yeah. they're ready to kind of come back. Yeah. Right. So I think you need some kind of objective um, tests and measures that um, will help guide your clinical decision making as a provider and also, you know, builds confidence in the patient. Totally. Yeah. And I think like, the level setting the expectation early that you have to have a clean table exam. What, what I mean by that is like, you should have passive range of motion and special test should not be like my shoulder hurts a lot when I do that because nothing's going to get better when you pick up a ball right. when you try to swing. So a cleared exam there, but the, yeah, those, those like objective, especially for like type one or type a, uh, you know, gymnasts or athletes that are really hardcore that want to see numbers improving, like having a set goal of like X amount of ER to IR or X amount of like strength raw improvement. I think that's a really good way to just get people, I guess, like, head head down from the clouds of like oh i'll just like do this for two weeks and i'll be better and i can throw my bullpen or whatever else is like that like clear objectives but then also the thing i think you guys do well on the baseball side and i try to do in gymnastics is we don't tell someone just because those numbers are hit they can go back and but you have to like do well on a graded exposure throwing program right so like you should be able to like cut light catch and have a couple like you know sessions of feeling good before we talk about you know getting really really hardcore and i feel like that's probably the last place to end this discussion is can you just chat a little bit about why that slow return to sport because my gymnastics programs are based off of the interval throwing programs that mike and lenny made and that's kind of a, a i think an important thing is like it's not all just like your numbers look good but you have to you have to feel good and do well over multiple weeks right right you're kind of passing the test as you're taking the test in some yeah. ways it's like in order to get to the next step you have to you have to pass the previous step mm. of the exam um yeah i think the the, the grading exposure is, is super important from a, a workload management standpoint Right. We're trying to build these athletes up into the point where they can compete at their sport. We have a relatively good idea of what it's of what's required mm. in terms of a pitch count at what intensity um, or, you know, the number of skills that someone's doing at a, a certain intensity. Um, so we're trying to design programs that gradually get them up to that point. And that gradual application of, of stress um, does a few things, but it helps to drive the adaptation of them getting you know, stronger um, as they continue to go, but also helps build confidence and, you know, shows the athlete that they're able to do, you know, they're able to throw without pain or they're able to do this gymnastic skill without mm. pain. 
And then we layer on a progression to that and it starts to look more and more like their sport. Um, and now they're in a, a better mental state and they're, they're feeling more prepared to kind of come back and, and compete at their sport. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the parallel that I think is useful for maybe between baseball and gymnastics, but any sport for people listening is like in, in throwing, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's the distance, right? Is, is more equal to more force, but also the repetitions and then the days per week, right? The frequency, those three things are like kind of your big variables. Is there anything else in the throwing program that's- The, you got the intensity, how hard they're throwing, yeah. right? So, um, you know, the, all those things will increase the amount of stress on certain tissues. Right. right? And so the- what injury they're coming into us with will will definitely dictate how we design these programs. Mm. Um, but overall, right, we don't want to go from zero stress on a thrower's elbow or shoulder to 100% effort, you know, full mm. amount of stress. So we, mm. we want to kind of bridge the gap between those two gradually over time and, and gradually increase that stress. Yeah. And we do the same thing in gymnastics, which is when we make programs, we can, there's different surfaces you can train on. So like trampolines are softer than like a medium floor versus like the actual hard floor, but also like the like low bars that aren't actually on the swinging is less than, and you can work your way up intensity wise. That's the same we use as the distance for throwing, but then also repetitions are the same and intensity in baseball, the intensity of throwing is the same as like progressions in gymnastics. So like basic skills and then medium effort skills and connected like really, really hard skills. So anyone who's maybe seen the programs that I make for gymnastics, it's modeled off the same three principles objectively and you just do every other day and you count them in the same way you would do a stepping program so i think it's important for people to realize that there's like a very it's, it's like a weird like mix of like a, a hard and a soft skill right it's like the concrete evidence of like number of repetitions or what you're doing and the forces from research but also kind of like a feel thing about like how did you feel the next day and like do you feel confident to go up to the next thing and are you nervous and you know i think a lot of guys particularly when you watch them throw that first like throw after tommy john is like ee! you know <laughs> yeah it starts to get better over time well, I will say like designing a, a return to gymnastics program has got to be a real challenge. Like there are so, <laughs> so many things to consider, so yeah. many different skills, like throwing a baseball is pretty straightforward. Mm. Um, but to be able to consider all the factors that go into getting back to a certain gymnastic skill has got to be mind blowing. But, yeah, it's a little, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like a blessing and a curse sometimes. I, I was joking with actually maybe Courtney or someone the other day about like, um, it's cool and not, not cool to be maybe tip of the spear with like Duesh and I and Joan and everybody else is like working with the gymnast because like you can't PubMed, you know, like what are right. the best progressions that way. But also it kind of gives you a fun little like, you know, teamwork collaboration to figure out what it is and then give that. I talked to a lot of college ATs that are like asking for our vol data and like asking for a lot of other like things that we do. And it's like, oh, this is kind of fun, but like, I'd rather feel more confident with a couple meta analysis, to be honest. Right. You know I mean? Exactly. It is what it is. Um, sweet, man. Well, that, that's a pretty good summary to kind of go from there. I guess the, the last little thing to talk about is when this episode comes out is you'll kind of be announced as a speaker. And I think the medical providers on that first day are going to be very looking forward to hearing the in-depth, you know, maybe lecture. So can you maybe just chat about uh, what you're going to talk about the symposium and kind of for the ATPT crew? Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, looking forward to, to speaking at the SHIFT symposium. I think it's awesome. I, I yeah. listened to all the episodes last year and it was great. Um, and so my talk will be on, on shoulders, um, <laughs> uh, but we'll do, update. <laughs> yeah, we'll do a deep dive, uh, into more gymnastics related injuries. Um, we'll talk a little bit in about this stress on the shoulder from a gymnastics perspective, um, how that differs from old other sports shoulder pathology. I think there's some cool research coming out about the location of, of gymnast shoulder injuries and how that's mm. different from other, um, you know, sports that we've seen and how the, what implications that has from a surgical standpoint, but also from a rehab standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll kind of do a, a deeper dive into more gymnastics related um, shoulder injuries. Um, we'll do some anatomy. We'll do some uh, more kind of rehab um, based progressions, how to get these people back to doing the sports that they love. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll break down specific examples of rehab um, yeah. techniques and protocols that we use and uh, then we'll try to transition that into a more advanced rehab protocol and getting people back into the gym and strength yep. training. Yeah, man, it's gonna be super sweet. I think some of the the bigger picture stuff will be awesome, but I know people are probably really like itching to get some like tactical, you know, exercises, progressions, things that, you know, for you, I think at this point are probably like, second nature, you know, like you just kind of know these progressions, but for everybody else, maybe it's, you know, they don't have a bird's eye view into the people we see. So they're probably really gonna get a lot of information out of it. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to it. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. I know you got patience, stuff like that, but uh, this was a cool little intro chat. So much appreciated. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. Cheers, man. Talk to you soon. Cheers.